This disease already has had a massive impact on the quality of health in our entire society. You're kind of made to feel like you're the only person that's ever gone through this. Trying to find treatment was one of the hardest things I think I've been through. When you wake up in the morning, you're not surprised anymore that you're going to have a day where you have a lot of pain. It continues to fascinate me how common this disease is and how big of a problem that it is. It's so easily fixable. If it was just the first thing that popped into doctors' minds when a patient came in with these weird symptoms, Lyme disease is a bacterial infection that's transmitted by ticks and it's caused by a spirochete, which is a spiral-shaped bacterium, and it causes a multi-system disease that can affect many parts of the body and cause many different types of symptoms. My name is Carrie Hodges and I have had chronic Lyme disease for over 10 years. I am 24 now. I first got sick when I was 14. I was at my brother's wedding and woke up one morning and had a flu-like illness with a really high fever, nausea, vomiting. A year after I first got sick, I started having extreme pain. That started the pain that I still have now and the pain could you know, be in my thumb for an hour and then move to my leg and it was just very excruciating. So I'm Kerry Clark. I'm a professor of epidemiology and environmental health at University of North Florida in Jacksonville. Well, Lyme disease is probably one of the greatest diagnostic challenges that faces our, our medical and public health communities today. And one of the reasons is because the symptoms imitate so many other conditions. Often in early stages, people have general flu-like symptoms. So they'll have body aches, maybe fever, uh, sometimes neck stiffness. And so that's often not recognized as Lyme, uh, unless there was a, a recent tick bite history. As I would have new problems come up, I would go see a specialist. So I was having headaches, I went to a neurologist. I was having um, problems with breathing, I'd go to a pulmonologist. So I was going to all these different specialists and no one was really able to pinpoint why I was having issues. Sometimes people recognize symptoms right after a tick bite and that makes it a little bit easier. And many times people don't get sick for weeks or months or maybe even years after they're initially infected. So my son had Lyme disease and if just the slightest pinhole of light came through the window, it would cause him excruciating pain. Because of this, we had to cover all the windows in our house with fleece blankets just to block out enough light. Yeah, he, he couldn't watch TV for a year or a year and a half because just the tiniest amount of light would cause him excruciating pain. At one point, before my son was diagnosed with Lyme disease, he was prescribed steroids by one of the doctors. He described the pain after taking that one steroid as feeling as if boiling water was being poured on his brain. I started getting sick around the age of 12. I struggled with uh, fatigue and I still have problems with fatigue at this point as long as having joint pain in my hips and in my elbows uh, and my neck. I think the disease really varies tremendously in its severity from person to person. I believe that some people can have very mild infection and live for years and years with Lyme. Other people become absolutely debilitated. It can affect the heart and absolutely some people have died from severe cardiac manifestations from Lyme. Whenever I was in college, I had, um, I started having some heart palpitations even more so than I did as a kid where episodes where I'd race and things just, I would get kind of short of breath, but I thought it was normal for a while until one day it didn't stop. I had to have a ablation procedure later, which is where they went in and burned a couple places in the heart to help me keep a regular beat so it wasn't taken off to the races anymore. You know, it was just one thing compounding on top of another. 
along with a short-term memory loss and you know knowing I was going somewhere I've been a hundred times before and all of a sudden on the way there I couldn't remember how to get there. When it starts to affect the patient cognitively then they become more aware of it and they, they get scared and that's when they really start seeking treatment. I diagnosed the first case of HIV AIDS in North Carolina in 83 and that became my passion because it was the thing that challenged me. I think the second week or third week I was there a, a woman walked in and, and said uh, do you treat Lyme disease and I said well this is an HIV clinic. I says I know but do you treat Lyme disease? So this lady asked me will you give me some tetracycline? So she's very <laughs> directive and I said I'll give you tetracycline probably but let's talk and let me examine you and let me and then you will have to have some blood tests to make sure the you know, your blood works all right on the drugs. Next week came around and um, in comes another lady and says, I hear you treat Lyme disease. After I started listening to a few people, I thought, you know, these are sick people. There's something going on here. And then, you know, I just said, I think we need to do more tick checks. And that's how I got started because yeah, I found it more fascinating. So I eventually um, built a clinic. And at one point I had the largest HIV practice between Philadelphia and Miami. And I had the largest Lyme practice in the world. My name is Emily Merritt. I'm a research associate at Auburn University School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences, and I'm the project manager for a project researching ticks and tick-borne illnesses all throughout the state. The biggest thing I've become surprised about in getting involved with this is how much human doctors, they're either not aware of tick-borne illnesses in general, or that they aren't as easy to teach as uh, like veterinarians or lay people that have been infected with the illness. I hear stories of people having more success going to vets to get treatment than to human doctors. I went to over 17 doctors, you know, it was just get referred from one to another. It took the vet I worked for to be friends with the surgeon who was gonna do the surgery to actually get a Lyme disease test even done. And it came back positive. I underwent lots of tests and saw many doctors from different specialties. At this point, I'd probably seen 20 doctors in various specialties. The other thing that's really fascinated me about Lyme is the number of people that are affected by it. We've known about Lyme for over 30 years. If we're having at least 300,000 new infections every single year, and if only 20% of those go on to develop chronic persistent infection, you can do the math pretty simply and you begin to realize that we have millions of people in this country right now who have Lyme right now. And that number, that prevalent pool is increasing every single year. I was studying Lyme disease for approximately 15 years already when I, I encountered it myself very personally. You know, often people pursue a, a vocation because of a personal experience or a family member affected by something, but that, that wasn't the case for me until um, the year 2010. I was investigating a neighborhood in northern Georgia and uh, collecting ticks and encountering many. I had several tick bites and within uh, several days I started having symptoms, flu-like symptoms, swollen lymph nodes and uh, that was the beginning for me. And uh, for me, I, I got early treatment. Within a week, I was being treated for Lyme, um, but unfortunately, that treatment didn't work or it was already too late. And many months later, then I experienced other symptoms. The Lyme epidemic is different in the sense that our patients get rejected by doctors and by institutions. Some of the doctors in Alabama just can't find anything that supports the idea this can be a multi-layered, you know, complex neurologic, debilitating immunosuppressive illness. I do believe that Lyme is considered a real threat um, and, and a major epidemic problem. We need to do a lot more research, predominantly in the southern U.S., to obtain hard evidence of actual human infection with Lyme and document how prevalent it is. We also need more evidence showing it in ticks, showing it in different species of ticks that more commonly bite people in the south, perhaps, than uh, the ticks that are biting people mostly in the northeast. 
I think the evidence will drive all of that. When it becomes overwhelming, it can't be ignored. I can promise you that every single day that I've been here, I've had a patient from North Carolina. At least once a week, if not twice a week, from South Carolina. Once or twice a week, somebody from Georgia, Alabama, occasionally Mississippi, occasionally Louisiana. It is everywhere. What I find most surprising is that people don't know all that much about the, the risks of going outdoors, when the ticks are active, how to prevent getting bitten by ticks, and what to do to properly remove them. Many patients uh, with Lyme end up having to pay out of pocket for their treatment because uh, many physicians will not treat patients long term or their insurance companies will not cover the long-term treatment. But the treatments uh, begin to, to um, cause an incredible financial burden for patients. Many patients end up having to travel to the Northeastern United States at tremendous expense um, to try to get the treatment that they need. In Alabama, we've had people who have lost all of their retirement. They've had to sell their homes. They couldn't afford utilities. So they've had utilities turned off. They've had to live out of their cars or out of their truck. And this is all because insurance would not cover their treatment. One of the most difficult things patients experience is the loss of friends and family members and other acquaintances. They just kind of drift off and it, it's almost as if they just become bored with the whole thing. It's so misunderstood and so many patients are considered to be malingerers and psychosomatic and so forth and so on. This disease is so destabilizing, it's essential that the patient have strong, uh, reliable support because um, in the worst case, you can't do anything for yourself. In many cases, you're compromised and just in doing basic tasks. You can't be treated for this disease as a sole individual. You need support. The reason I started the Alabama Lyme Disease Association was for my son's future. Specifically, I wanted to change the perception in the medical community, and I wanted the public to be aware that we do have a problem here. My simple goal was to never hear the words that we don't have Lyme disease in Alabama. Before I started the association, I started a website that was called Lyme Stories. It was just an aggregate of stories that I found on the internet. And so many of those stories mimicked our own experiences. So we just branched out from there and just started reaching more and more people. Almost every person we would talk to would know someone who had Lyme disease. And so we'd go talk to that person and they would know someone else and we'd go to find a neighborhood that would have eight people on one street that would have Lyme disease. And so we'd find these little centers, these little networks of people, and we would find the center of that network and we'd start connecting everyone. And from that, we grew into what we are today. The mission of the Alabama Lyme Disease Association is awareness and education. The way we're accomplishing this is by bringing together legislators, the medical community, research community, and all those affected by Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases in Alabama. I'm Becky Nordgren. I represent House District 29 in the Alabama House of Representatives. I'm a member of the uh, Health Committee. I was contacted by several constituents in my area who claimed to have Lyme disease or who suspected that they had Lyme disease. They were told by physicians in our state that Lyme disease did not exist in Alabama and that there was no need to test to see even if they had Lyme disease. We formed a temporary study commission on tick-borne illness. We have now, by legislative act, instituted a permanent Alabama study commission on tick-borne illness. It will last at least till 2020. We have a UAB uh, uh, infectious disease uh, expert on our commission. We have an expert from uh, Southern Research uh, Company, uh, Senator Slade Blackwell, myself, um, and we invite every bit of information that any researcher wants to give us to put in our studies. The only thing that's gonna help these patients that are hurting hourly, they're in intense pain, and 
they're left on their own is for medical professionals to understand that the problem exists and for them to take an interest in treating these patients. So I talked to my son's Lyme disease doctor, the physician who's treating him for Lyme disease, about starting the Alabama Lyme Disease Association because I wanted to implement change for those affected by Lyme disease and other tick-borne diseases in Alabama. And when I told him this, he said, just please do one thing for me. He said, please provide hope for these patients. And they should have hope because there is hope and things are going to get better. There's definitely hope out there. Um, I'm so much better than I was to begin with. It's just, it's a long road. It's not a quick, easy fix. Um, if you can have supportive family and friends, it helps out a lot. You know, I, I've been fortunate in that aspect, but, uh, and it's definitely a strain financially. Don't give up on it. The thing that got me out of bed was just being like, I have a future. I want to be a nurse. This is my dream. I have a lot of patients that come through and they may have chronic problems and they're very defeated and discouraged. I'm able to provide that care and compassion because I have been in their place. Let's get a handle on this. We need to do it while we have the resources and the uh, ability to do it and save a lot of lives. And we just need that person or persons who are powerful and dedicated enough to, to be a voice and, and demand change.